This is Greg Pass with the Americans in Wartime Experience. Today's date is March the 12th, 2022, and I have the pleasure of sitting down through a Zoom interview with um, Gavin McElvina. I probably, I massacred it last time, I'm sure I did it again. Yeah, uh, it's okay. Gavin, uh, tell us your full name and the right way to say it. Uh, Gavin Lloyd McElvina. Okay. And uh, Gavin, where are you at right now? Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Hood River, Oregon. Outstanding. Where is that in relation to the state? Um, it is uh, the top of the state between Oregon and Washington along the Columbia River Gorge. It's about an hour uh, east of the city of Portland. Gotcha. So um, we had sat down in the mobile recording studio in Arlington, Virginia in November of um, 2021, and we documented your story of military service. But in case somebody's just watching this portion of the video, can you give us a Reader's Digest version real quick, down and dirty? about sure. when, when you when you enlisted um, and um, the, the gist of your, um, your military career um, up until retirement. Certainly. Well, I enlisted in, uh, in November of 1989 um, as an 11 Bravo and was assigned to Italy uh, with the Airborne Battalion Combat Team. And through my 23 years of service, I've then been deployed to Iraq on a couple of occasions, was part of uh, the peacekeeping operations in Bosnia, as well as contingency operations in um, Africa. Um, and I rose to the rank of Sergeant Major and probably about the midpoint of my career, I had the unique opportunity to be assigned as a relief commander. And then later on the assistant Sergeant of the Guard at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in Arlington National Cemetery. What was the first time that you went to Arlington National Cemetery? Were you in service or were you a civilian? I was in the service. I was actually in between um, units. So I was uh, PCSing from Italy, and I was going to be assigned to the Pathfinder Company at the 101st Airborne Division or Assault out at Fort Campbell. And um, I drove across the country because I'd never done that. So I was able to go to Washington, D.C. in the wintertime. So it was about a December of 92-ish, I think it was. Uh, and I went into Arlington, and, and I I quite honestly didn't know what to expect. Um, growing up uh, on the you know West Coast uh, in a small town in Oregon, uh, we didn't really learn about the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier or Arlington in general. We saw the you know stuff on TV, you know Memorial Day and Veterans Day, but didn't really learn about it. So that was my opportunity to go through the cemetery. I'd never been there. I enjoyed it, um, and I remember sitting on the steps of the Memorial Amphitheater watching the Sentinel walk back and forth. And so as it's winter time, um, they're doing hour long walks. So I got a, a plenty of time to just watch the precision of the Sentinel as they did their duty. And came time for the guard change. And out comes a relief commander. And, and at this point, I'm only an E4, but out comes a relief commander who's an E6. It was a position that later on I would be able to take. And he starts his um, spiel, as we call it, you know, introducing people as to what they're about to see in Arlington National Cemetery and the changing of the guard. And it gets to a point where it talks, you know, the, the relief commander says it's requested that everyone remain silent and standing. And at that point, I've been sitting on the steps and I was at an angle. So he was just kind of over there. And when he said it, though, I felt like he was talking directly to me. Cause I, and I felt so embarrassed that I was sitting on the ground. I should have been standing the whole time. I, I just didn't, I didn't understand, you know, uh, the similarity of the area and, and, and why the Sentinels were doing what they were doing. So jump right to my feet and uh, they went on with their guard change. And so that was, that was my first introduction to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Um, I remember in basic training, um, standing in front of the big poster that lists all the medals and badges that a soldier could possibly earn while in the military and, and a drill sergeant pointed out the tomb guard identification badge and said you'll never see that on a living person because it was so rare um, and at that point it was the second rarest medal or I'm sorry uh, medallion or badge that was given out by the army and uh, it wasn't long after that a couple more years that I finally met two tomb guards as they had transitioned from Fort Myer Virginia to Italy where I was assigned again um, and I got to talk, talking to these staff sergeants, um, and I was a, a staff sergeant myself and, and, uh, felt that that was uh, something that I wanted to do, uh, was go and, and stand the watch over those who have served and sacrificed on behalf of our nation. Um, up through that point, I'd lost some friends in, in conflicts, 
And I felt it was a, an appropriate way to remember what they had done. So what, what year was this that you would have been assigned to um, Old Guard? I was assigned in uh, August of 97. And uh, then I PCS'd as an, out as of an there. E6. As an E6. Yeah, and e ets out of there in uh, sometime in 2000. I can't remember the month. I want to say it was October, November of 2000, but. So, you know, you know, you alluded to it. Not a lot of guys have um, the honor of having that assignment and fewer have, have that assignment going into it as, as, as an E6. Um, wh what is that like getting involved in a unit like that where you're walking in, you're, um, you're the most inexperienced guy when it comes to um, that assignment but by far, you probably have more military experience than anybody else. Is that what's that like? Is that a weird environment? It, it was a weird environment. I mean, I was coming off of, of active airborne units with, uh, you know, point of the spear type missions um, and had been deployed numerous times already. Uh, like I alluded to before, I'd lost friends in those deployments. Uh, so I, I thought I was pretty ahead of my peers at the time. Um, I thought that, you know, as uh, someone that, that takes pride in, in being a professional soldier, that I knew how to march and call commands and things such as that. Um, but when I got to the old guard, I learned really quickly that none of that mattered um, to the extent of performing the duties there. Leadership, of course, matters. And it did at the time. But um, I, I didn't know how to march the way they wanted me to. I didn't know how to call commands the way they wanted to me. I certainly didn't know how to press a uniform or or, or shine boots the way that, that, that was expected. So um, it was a little bit of a struggle to get to the tomb just because of my rank. Um, at the tomb, there's three reliefs. Those are commanded by staff sergeants. And since I'm six foot four, um, there's only one relief that I could go to. And that's the first relief because they're the tallest. Uh, and you need to be six two and above to, to go to that relief. So um, you know, when I showed up and I expressed my desire to go to the tomb or try out, I should say, for the tomb, because you have to go through a process of, of learning. Uh, they promptly told me that I wasn't going to be able to get down there because I was a staff sergeant and someone already was in that position. So, you know, I was going through the rest of the process, learning how to, to uh, go through the manual of arms and the saber manual. Uh, when about three months later, an opportunity arrived to try out for the tomb as the relief commander down there. Um, yeah, Mo, I think I only had one other soldier on my relief that had previous assignments in the army other than the old guard. Um, everybody else pretty much came into the old guard from that low, you know, from their first assignment. So um, I was able to bring a little bit more experience to the table as a relief commander and, and, and talk about the bigger picture of the army and what's out there other than just what's at Fort Myer. And so I, I um, we, we, we went out to Arlington um, three days over the last two weeks and had, had the privilege of interviewing a whole bunch of guys, most of which are young kids, like, like you, like you had mentioned, I mean, straight out of AIT and they went, they went to Fort Myer. Um, they were talking about how they had to get selected and, and learn the knowledge and all this testing as an E6 relief commander. Are you going through a similar process or how does that work? No, uh, definitely. Uh, you know, you, you try out for what we called at the time TDY. So it's a two week period of where they evaluate you uh, and they give you bare minimal knowledge to memorize. They give you the mission. They they get you onto the mat so you can start to learn the sequence. And as a relief commander, my job is not to walk the mat. My job is to change the guard. So I had to learn something different than the other trainees that were going through at the time. Um, the training process once assigned to the relief. So after two weeks, they said, yeah, you're good enough to continue in the training process. Um, then I was assigned to my relief and I had two E5s that were already um, badge qualified or tomb guard qualified. They'd gone through the process and they took me under their wing to teach me the skills to learn to become a, a relief commander at the tomb. And uh, again, you know, the, the normal Army Day business leadership and managing your soldiers and, and, and maintaining their welfare, all of that, that was easy. Um, that's something I've been doing before. But change the guard, learning the to become a guard, 
I had two grade E5s that, that taught me those things and, and other soldiers that had already, you know, passed the test and were qualified tomb guards. So they didn't take it easy on me. That's for sure. Uh, I had my fair share of uh, cleaning the barracks just as a, a private would have to clean a barracks. Um, but it's just to a higher standard. Um, and uh, the, they didn't hold back if my uniform wasn't correct or my commands weren't correct or my angles or my weapons inspection wasn't to standard, they would make me do it again and again and again until they were comfortable saying, yeah, I think we can start having him pass some tests. That took me about three months to earn the respect and show some sort of skills uh, in, my, in my job before they let me out in front of the public. Um, and then, and they only let me close the cemetery. So, um, that was, uh, very nerve wracking to learn the skills and then have to do it in front of the public. Um, you mentioned height. So I, I didn't know this until going to Arlington last week that each relief on or about to the same height. Can you explain, sp explain how that works and the logic behind that? Well, each relief is broken down by height, and that's to, to present uniformity when you see a relief that's doing their job. Um, the third relief is what we call the short relief. They're about 5'11 to 6 foot. Uh, second relief is 6 to 6'2, six and then first relief is 6'2 and higher. And again, it just, uh, you know, as, as you look at the Sentinel on the mat, you're, you're not going to see much of change in the uniform or the way they do business or, or how they march or call commands or anything. It's very minimal. So we're trying to get that uniformity down. And so height is one of the ways that, that we do that. Obviously, we're all proportionally built. Um, you know, we look good in uniform, um, meet the Army standards and things such as that. Tell us a little bit about the first time you were out, out front as a relief commander when, they're, when um, the area is packed with people during the day. Butterflies, I mean, how, how, what's that like? Oh, terrified. Uh, and, and, it, and it's, it's odd to say that, but it is terrifying because not only do I have, you know, a couple thousand people standing on the steps that are all watching you call commands or say something or do something on the plaza, uh, but then my trainers were there and they were even harsher, you know, cause they were, they know what they're looking at. Whereas the public, they, they just see it. They don't, they don't understand that I'm messing up or I'm missing something. Um, so a tremendous amount of pressure on, on your shoulders to go out there and, and do it right because the unknown soldiers demand that perfection. And the last thing I wanted to do was go out there at any time, even in training and screw it up and for them, you know, you know they, they've earned that eternal rest. They've earned our respect and, and us watching over them and, and you don't want to do it wrong. So there's a lot of pressure there. And, and that night that they let me out in public for the first time, uh, it was raining. And all I had to do was go out and uh, they didn't let me change the guard, but just close the cemetery. So after my ARC or assistant relief commander went out and changed the guard out, then I walked out onto the plaza. And because it was dark and it was rainy, I didn't have sunglasses on and everyone's taking pictures. And so you've been up there, you know, it's white marble and you, you have pictures with flash, you know, flash cameras going on. It's just blinding. And that's what I remember was this kind of gray, rainy day, night, and just flash after flash after flash in my eyes. And, and I'm pretty sure I didn't do it right um, because they didn't let me outside for about another month. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and it's, again, the, the, the training style that they use, which is repetition over and over again, and then looking at it from different angles certainly helps um perfect the job of the sentinel to guard the unknown soldier because most people don't know again that it, it's an active duty guard post it it's not a ceremonial post it's it's a real guard post with the uh, you know general rules and special rules so you have to do it right by army regulation so um last week when i was when i was up in arlington i heard a number of guards using the words i earn my time on the mat I never, out of all the interviews I did, I never heard anybody saying they were assigned. Um, most people might not understand what that means. In other words, when, when a boss tells a guy, hey, I need you to go do X, Y, Z at his job, that's an assignment. But the guards look at that particular job as, as they're earning it. Can you um, delve into that a little bit? Certainly. Um, you know, obviously, once you've gone through the training process, you are assigned to the platoon. 
but to go out and actually do your job of guarding the unknown soldiers, you certainly have to pass a lot of tests and a lot of checks to make sure that you are prepared to do that uh, in the manner that we want. So while we are always striving for perfection, we know that we can never achieve that. And so we're continually pushing it. So when you have a group of trainees that are downstairs and they want to go out and do the job, they want to stand on the mat and guard the unknown soldiers, whether it's daytime or nighttime, whether there's thousands of people watching or nobody watching, they want to go outside. They have that burning desire to do their job uh, and to watch over the unknown soldiers. So in the training process, we, you know, you can only put one person out there at a time. So they have to earn the opportunity. And so that falls to the, the trainers to look at who is standing above the rest. You know, and, and in an organization where perfection is something we all strive for, everybody is really doing their best. Um, but someone has to shine and stand out. So whether it's learning your knowledge a little bit more and being able to show your trainer that I, I know more than just what's written on the paper that you gave me. I, you know, I'm, I'm doing more than just memorizing something. I'm diving into the history of that person and giving you some more information. Or I've, I've spent countless hours in front of the mirror perfecting my angles because I want to go out and do the job. Those things get noticed by the trainees or trainers, excuse me. And that's how you earn a walk or earn a guard change. Um, you know, even though I was the relief commander, there was no guarantee that I was going to be able to, in the training process, change the guard, unless my assistant relief commander said that I'd earned the opportunity to go do that. Um, and the only way to earn it was to show that you've got the dedication to put all that extra time in to perfect your job uh, of guarding the unknown soldiers. What do you think? Um one of your fondest memories of your service at Arlington. Do you have any thoughts on that? Fondest memories? I've got an <laughs> awful lot from the time that I served down at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. I think there are some dates that definitely stood out more than others. Um, and, and probably, um, I distinctly remember a long, hot summer day in wool uniform that I was on my feet for basically 20 some odd hours. But I think the one that's going to stand out the most is the date that that uh, during my time, we had four unknown soldiers. We had the Vietnam unknown soldier as well. And it was during my, my time frame on 14 May, 1998, that the Vietnam unknown soldier was disinterred and uh, removed from the plaza and removed from our care and uh, sent to DNA testing and, and later identified. That was a, a big moment in our history as tomb guards and, and as those of us that stood the watch over four unknown soldiers because it certainly felt like we were losing a brother, um, someone that we had cared for for 14 years, uh, stood the watch over, talked to in the middle of the night, wondered about you know, their life and how they died uh, and the service that they provided, not only the brothers and sisters to their left and right, but to our nation. So when having him removed from the plaza that we stood the watch over, that was a pretty significant moment and something that will remain with me the rest of my life. Not to put you on the spot, but do you, do you know where he, he was placed after that, by chance? Yeah, the uh, St. Louis uh, or Jefferson Barracks National um, Cemetery in St. Louis. And I obviously identified as Captain Michael Blase of the United States Air Force. It's uh, interesting. Um, his history, now learning about him after the fact, is because uh, the date that he was shot down was May 11th, 1972. And I was born on May 11th, 1970. So um, just kind of an odd little coincidence in his life's history as well as mine. Um, and he was actually disinterred, what, three days after he'd been shot down so many years later. So, hmm. That is interesting. Yeah. All right, let's fast forward a little bit. So um, you became involved, um, very involved with the um, nonprofit organization that's associated with the tomb. Can you talk about that and your role in the organization? Yeah, we, uh, we, we created this, the Society of the Honor Guard Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in 1999 um, as a way to continue our mission as tomb guards and educate people um, and bring our tomb guard family together because we're a very small, close-knit group of individuals. And throughout the years, we, we had a lot of good educational um, projects that we, that we led as tomb guards. We did some great reunions bringing people together that hadn't seen each other in 30 years or been on the plaza in 30 years. And then as we started looking a little further into the future, we realized that in 2021, that was the centennial 
of the anniversary of the World War I unknown soldier was buried in Arlington National Cemetery. And we knew that as a nation, this was an opportunity for us to reunite uh, as, as one common people behind one thing. And we started looking into how does service and sacrifice spill outside of the tomb into everyday life or everyday Americans. And we wanted to find a way to connect the tomb again with all of America. So we, we did a little bit of research into the history. Um, and obviously as tomb guards, we know our history pretty well. And we started looking at some of the key dates. And the one thing when I was the centennial chairman and I was the president at the time of the society, I looked at was every single time that an unknown soldier came home uh, to the United States and before their burial in Arlington National Cemetery, they went to the US Capitol and they lay in state. And this was done because it allowed not only the fighting men and women who served with this individual, uh, give them an opportunity to pay their respects, but open it up for the entire populace to pay their respects to the service and sacrifice of this unknown American who has passed. Um, obviously the dignitaries, the presidents, foreign visitors would also have an opportunity to pay their final respects before their burial in Arlington. And when I read, um, on all three instances, whether it was uh, November 9th and 10th in 1921, prior to the burials in 1984, uh, as well as in 1958, the, the big thing that was standing out for me was the fact that they had to close the doors to the Capitol early or, or when it was time and still turn people away who wanted to come in and pay their respects. The outpouring of love and emotion was so strong in those generations of, of Americans and service members who'd, who'd served when that unknown soldier fell, that they wanted to, to pay those respects. And it got to the point where they had to actually close the doors on them. Um, and I wanna say that for like 1921, the centennial, there were over 50,000 people. And I'm sure the number is not entirely accurate. There's probably higher numbers that were turned away, that they couldn't have that opportunity. So we wanted to try and find a way to take that emotion where the nation gets an opportunity to be close to the unknown soldiers to pay their respects in 2021 and find a way to bring them in into and closer to the unknown soldier. We felt that having a recreation at the Capitol with a casket um, just wouldn't suffice. People would figure that out. It's not, not a real thing. It's a mock-up. Um, so we had sat down, myself and Richard Azaro, a former tomb guard who walked in 1963 and 1965, and we tried to figure out a way to take that experience of being there in person and move it closer to the tomb. So we came up with a, 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 a carnation ceremony that would allow the public to walk onto the plaza for the first time in many, many years and lay a flower at the unknown soldiers and then walk off the plaza. Um, we pitched the idea to Arlington National Cemetery, who is the federal agent during the commission, uh, during the centennial, and they loved the idea. Um, now logistically, it, it, it was a challenge to, to find a way to, to maintain the security of the site uh, while allowing the public to come inside the chains. So the, the chains themselves uh, weren't there in 1921. But those came later on and eventually over time the chains have been pushed out and the, and the public pushed a little further away from the unknown soldiers they don't get a chance to come onto the actual plaza where the sentinel walks so this would be that opportunity that once in a lifetime opportunity to be able to walk on with your family maybe you've never served in the military at all and you've only read about this or maybe seen a picture but this is that opportunity for you to come onto the plaza and pay your respects to each of the unknown soldiers who'd fallen on or represented on the plaza. And, and thinking about it, one of the things that, that was driving me was the fact that I wanted to take my granddaughter up there and do that. Um, knowing that that will be the only opportunity that she and I uh, would ever have to stand on the plaza of the tomb of the unknown soldier together. Um, and, and that's, why we came up with this is it because it, it opens doors to generations of Americans for a unique experience to once again connect with the unknown soldiers uh, and honor their service and their sacrifice.
So I understand you guys had to, to physically move some things around. Um, obviously, the chains had to come down, but you moved the mat toward the Potomac side. Is that correct? How did how did that play out? Was that was that a challenge for the Sentinels? Uh, I don't think it was a challenge. Uh, Rich there uh, in 1963-65, so the mat was in the same spot. When I was down there, it was in the same spot with the exception of about the week of the disinternment in May of 1998, when the mat was moved to a lower level landing to facilitate uh, preparing a plaza to remove the, the Vietnam unknown soldier. Uh, in our history as tomb guards, the mat has been moved around on a couple occasions for burials of the unknown soldiers or in, the, in case of the disinterment. So we had the institutional knowledge about it. We just had to find some tomb guards that said, yeah, no, I remember doing that. And this is what we did so that we could take that, that historical knowledge and give it to the current Sentinels and say, this is an option. You know, as a society, we're a nonprofit right? and we're made up of, of Americans, uh, patriots and, and former tomb guards. So we don't control anything on the on the plaza of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. That, that falls to the army, uh, to the tomb guard platoon, as well as Arlington National Cemetery. All we could do is provide them with our you know, expertise and, and suggestions. So we, we actually drew up a whole plan um, that showed the, the mat being moved to just on the front side uh, of the tomb where the three figures are, uh, while continuing a tomb guard or excuse me, a guard change and a rotation and allowing the public to come on and, and pay their respects without interfering with that process. Um, the, the Sergeant of the Guard at the time, Chelsea Porterfield was able to work some of her magic as Sergeant of the Guard and develop a plan that seemed to work and everybody within the army in Arlington National Cemetery, uh, you know, approved that plan and, and, and we made it work. For the Sentinels themselves, if you talk to them, you'll find that it, it probably didn't take too much to, to, to retool the mindset to a, a different sequence, uh, because once you get on the mat, the sequence is the same, um, and the guard change and the commands are the same. It's just the location. So um, from what I saw, they, they absolutely crushed it. They did a fantastic job. As, as, as a tomb guard, I would expect that, uh, learning a new sequence and doing it in front of the public during some very challenging days for them. Um, I, I would have loved to have been there uh, on duty at that time to hear the public uh, that close to the Sentinel, because during our time, the, the chains are, are further away. So you don't get that, that close feeling of the, of the public right there. Um, Richard and some of the young, older tomb guards could talk about how it was like to have a mother standing behind them telling you a story of their loved one who is now missing or dead or unknown and never came home and hearing the story behind you as you're doing your job and then turning around when you when you can and and, and that person's gone that that's that storyteller has disappeared back into the fabric of america um so i would love to hear the feelings and what those guys on guys and gals on the mat felt when the public was that close because uh you know as a tomb guard i've been on the plaza many times even um, after I've been lucky enough to be on the plaza a few more times after I left. Uh, but it's still overwhelming every time I do it. Um, I, I break down because of the power of the unknown soldiers in the tomb itself and, and just the, the reverence of the area. So I, I can only imagine what someone who'd never been there before must have felt like coming onto the plaza and just feeling this overwhelming presence of the unknown soldiers. He interviewed the um, a former um, deputy uh, defense secretary a few weeks ago who was involved, uh, Dr. Uh, Hamry. And um, he described Arlington National Cemetery, he used the, the words unique and special. Why, why is it that you think Arlington National Cemetery, and particularly the Tomb of the Unknown Soldiers, is so unique and special in the American landscape? Well, um... I think that it falls into those categories in a couple of ways. One, Americans do things differently. That's for sure. When you look at some of the other nations that are out there, they have unknown soldiers. And, and we followed um, what France and England did in 1920 uh, to create our own Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Um, they do things a little different. They don't have a standing watch. They don't have someone that's there over them 24-7. They have a monument. Um, 
and the public is able to come and go uh, as close as, as their governments allow. We chose to have a perpetual guard in 1926 and then, then the 24 hour guard starting in 1937 because we felt it was important to stand watch over those that served and sacrificed. Arlington itself is truly a unique place. If you have never had the opportunity to go there and you wander uh, through the cemetery, you're going to see graves of everyone from a president of the United States, two presidents actually, all the way down to a slave. They're all buried there. Citizens, nation builders, soldiers, simple to uh, you know, high, highly educated people, they're all buried there because that's the, that's the fabric of our nation. We all come together. We all do things uh, to, to make our nation move forward. And in Arlington, you can see all of that by walking those headstones. So the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier is definitely a place of reverence. Um, it sends a clear message to our allies. It sends a clear message to uh, our younger citizens of the nation when they see a sentinel standing the watch 24 seven. They know that the Department of Defense and our nation will do what's necessary to protect and bring home our loved ones, even if they've fallen in battle. And they will remember and honor their service and sacrifice all the time. And you see that. Um, I know I've spoken with uh, former military District of Washington commanders that, that talked about when, when foreign visitors, foreign heads of state see that sentinel walking, they realize that here's a nation that is, is committed to their servicemen and women by posting a sentinel over the grave of an unidentified soldier. And that speaks volumes about our character as Americans and what we're willing to do for our allies. So that's why I think it's very special and, and unique. Um, it is a reverent place. I, I love going to Arlington National Cemetery and just enjoying the peacefulness of the whole area and then being able to wander amongst the headstones uh, and, and see my brothers and sisters in arms. So during the, um, the, the, the Sentinel, um, the 100 year anniversary last year, did, did when you observed the, the audiences and the people that, that came to be there, do you think as, as a general rule that they pretty much think of our ANC like you do? In other words, do you think that most of the American public understands the importance of the hollow ground there? I think that you get an opportunity to see people's minds get changed when they come up to the watch, the changing of the guard. Um, I know that uh, I used to escort people there and I would ask them to, to look back at the audience. Don't look at what the Sentinels are doing or the relief commander, but look at the audience and you can see when the light bulb comes on for some young Americans or even some visitors. I think overall, the public doesn't understand Arlington as well as the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier just because they, they haven't had an opportunity to go there and see it themselves. And that's one of the big missions of the society is that educational process. So we try and get out to the communities so that we can talk about those things and why it's important that a Sentinel stands to watch 24 seven and why it's important that young men and women want to do that duty and stand the watch over those graves. Um, I think by more education and just, just exposure to it, you will get more of our nation to understand why it really is the soul of America. Um, you know, where if Arlington's the heartbeat then, then the tomb is the soul. That's where we carry on. And it's, that's what, how we honor and remember millions of Americans who have stepped forward and served on behalf of others. So I understand the Crow Nation um, was able to participate in the ceremonies. Did you get a chance to observe that? And what's the significance of that? Well, again, as, as we were doing our centennial process, we wanted to find a way to make the centennial not just so centric to Washington, D.C. We wanted to find a way to to bring in all of America. And uh, we reached out kind of early to the Crow Indian Nation and asked about um, how we can bring them into the centennial process. Um, I had an opportunity to go out to uh, Chief Plenty Coup State Park where Chief Plenty Coup's residence is and it's in the heart of the Crow Nation there uh, and interact with their honor guard uh, and the flag bearer, uh, Ellsworth Goes Ahead. Um, we felt it was important that if in 1921, a dignitary from a, an allied nation or a representative from the Crow Indian nation was present for the burial of the World War I unknown soldier 
it was important for them to be there in 2021. So we started those conversations to, to not only bring them into it, but allow them the, a broader opportunity to educate America about Chief Plenty Coup and all the things that he did. You know, this, this was one point in his very distinguished and long uh, history. Um, and he is an important uh, person to the nation, um, whether it's the Crow Indian nation or the American nation, we're all Americans. And, and if you read anything about uh, Chief Plenty, you'll see how he was able to bridge those gaps between different cultures. And I think it was important and an opportunity that, that the Crow Indian nation should have been given in 2021. So we, we helped them work through some of the process um, for them to come up and be a part of those the flower ceremony on November 9th and 10th, uh, 2021. I, I can say that seeing them in the regalia um, and watching them be on the plaza was overwhelming for me um, because I can see the history. I can see the tie. And every one of those members of the honor guard, they're all veterans. They get it. They understand the unknown soldiers. Uh, and for them, it was an honor. But I, I can tell you, uh, for a lot of the Sentinels, it was an honor just to be a, around them. They, they're, they're that important to us in our, our history. Um, after the, the Crow Indian Nation um, was able to lead everybody uh, in this flower ceremony, they went into the Memorial Amphitheater and they started singing. Uh, and it was impromptu. Uh, but you had uh, the entire honor guard up on the stage. You had all of the, the people that had come from the village that, that wanted to be a part of this trip, which was amazing. And they all started singing and, and the drum beats were going. And as standing inside the amphitheater, I watched crowds suddenly just start to filter in to see what was going on and hear their song and, and listen to the drum beat. And, and observe their way of honoring the unknown soldier through these, these songs. And that was, uh, that was awesome. Uh, it, it, put it simply, it was awesome. It, it, it gave chills down my spines. It was inspiring to see them. Uh, and again, here it is, we're all coming together as one nation. Um, as one peoples to honor and remember in, in our own unique ways. And, and that was a great visual. And uh, to be able to stand next to some of the family members as they did that was powerful. Can you tell us about any uh, challenges um, on the flip side, successes of the planning that went in to um, um, putting together something of this size? Well, there's always challenges, uh, you know, and as, as a nonprofit, again, I, I don't own any any, any of the property that we were trying to look at. Um, Centennial driven wise, we wanted to have that broader reach. Um, you know, and I work on a day-to-day -day basis in, in, a, in my own professional career. So this is all voluntary, uh, not getting paid for it, but we started reaching out to not only the Crow Indian Nation in Montana, um, but the Independent Seaport Museum where the USS Olympia currently resides in Philadelphia. We reached out to France, the government of France to facilitate some ceremonies and remembrances uh, over there in October of 2021. Uh, we tried to reach out to as many members of Congress as we could and, and just the public in general. Uh, so we had a lot of projects that were going and being run by different volunteers all across the US and overseas um, that all had ties back to the unknown soldier in some fashion. And this was their opportunity to talk about their role in, in the unknown soldiers. Um, and I can tell you, when we went to France, the people of France remember that unknown soldier. They remember how important it is that someone came to their nation and defended them in their time of need. Uh, and it's one of those things that, uh, you know, as, as I went through the centennial process, I learned a lot as a tomb guard. Uh, and it dawned on me that, you know, during the, Fran or during the American Revolution, France came to our aid. And I don't think many people remember that fact is that, you know, here we are a struggling nation, uh, much like what you're seeing you know, today in, in, in what's going on uh, over in Ukraine. Um, someone has to come to the aid and France came to our aid and we returned the favor in 1917 when we came to theirs and we returned it later on in World War II. And then we've been strong allies ever since. They're our oldest ally. Um, and the people truly remember this. Uh, it's taught in their schools. 
about the Americans, all these unknown Americans that came over to assist them in being free and, and the society that they have today. So when we paid our respects to uh, the unknown soldiers that weren't selected during that process in 1921, we had the opportunity to interact with the, the French people. And it was powerful for them that this centennial was going on and they got an opportunity to be a part of it. Um, for them, it was very honorable. Um, and I, I don't know if we had something similar in the US that, that the entire nation would feel that way. France does. We remember since so many American. Can you hear me, Gavin? You're buffering there. Oh, was I? Oh, I'm sorry. No, no worries. No worries. Um, when you think about, think back to last year in the ceremony, any particular um, observations you had that stand out in your memory, whether it be observations of veterans groups showing up, VIPs, or just a kid, a little kid that was watching. Do you have anything that stands out in your mind as being uh, special about um, people that came there to pay honor to the Tomb of the Unknowns? Well, during the flower ceremony, it was, uh, I, th I think what stood out for me was just seeing the different demographics of our nation that was there. From people that were bringing infants up, which aren't, aren't going to remember it, but toddlers to children to adults to old generations, veterans and non-veterans, government officials, and just the everyday American citizen. They all were intermingled. Um, and they were all presented that opportunity to come onto the plaza and pay their respects. And I think it overwhelmed each one in a different way. I think each person walked away with feeling something uh, maybe they hadn't felt before. And again, that's what the two million of soldiers does all the time on a daily basis is, is, is really make some Americans out there and, and educate people on service and sacrifice. Um, you know, what stood out for me was the, the opportunity to um, walk onto the plaza with my granddaughter and both of us lay a flower and, and, and pay our respects to the unknown soldier. I know she still talks about that. I know it's an important part of my life, knowing that I've had that opportunity that'll never come again. Um, you know, and then uh, my wife was able to go out the next day and she is a veteran. Um, and she went out there with her daughter and her granddaughter as well. And, you know, that's, the, those are the things that I remember seeing the pictures from different angles of, of all the different people and the, the expressions and the similarity of the, the whole event, I, I think was just powerful and important for our nation at the time. Do you have anything else you wanted to add to the story about the um, centennial um, ceremonies? Well, specifically, if we're going to talk about the flowers, um, you know, none of this would have been possible if it wasn't for a lot of the volunteers who went out there, whether they're American Gold Star Mothers or veterans, uh, American Legion, the Two Million the Soldier Foundation, working together to assist the public through the ceremony that was approved by Arlington as well as the army. You know, if we hadn't come together as a nation, as different organizations, whether they're nonprofit or uh, governmental, this wouldn't have been able to happen. And, and it takes, um, you know, uh, strong people to bridge some gaps and come up with a viable plan that everybody can agree on and, and execute in a very public forum. So I think that uh, my great appreciation for all those who, when asked, they, they set aside their, their personal lives to make it happen. Uh, and, and I, you know, it's not to say that it didn't go off flawlessly, but there's always something behind the curtain that, that doesn't go right. But out in front of the curtain, I think everybody got an opportunity to see something amazing and be a part of something amazing. Well, in closing, I got one last question for you. I, I heard, I heard um, some chatter when I was at ANC last couple of weeks about the question is, well, should we wait another hundred years to do another one? What are, what are your personal thoughts on that? Do um, you think we should wait another hundred years or do it every 25? What are your thoughts? Well, I don't think we should wait another hundred years. I think that the next time, and this is just a personal opinion from a tomb guard. I think the next time that, that we should do something similar to this would be in 2058, May of 2058, when we mark the 100th anniversary of the double internment of the World War II and the Korean War Unknown Soldiers. I think that would be another great opportunity. I think that if this gets turned into something that happens every year 
it's going to lose its impact and its meaning. Um, it, it was truly a once in a lifetime event, marking that 100th anniversary for the burial of the unknown soldier from World War One. I. I think that we should hold off till 19 or 2058 to to mark that occasion. Um, and I, then I think the next one after that, which should be in 2084, when we mark um, the, uh, the time when the Vietnam unknown soldier was laid to rest there. Uh, I think it's important to find ways to continue to provide our veterans with a way to heal. And, and a meaningful way of doing that is this. Um, obviously, I'm uh, a private citizen and have absolutely no control of what the government's going to do. But uh, at the end of the day, if they ask my opinion, that's, that's what I would give is to wait until 2058 and then, and then do it again. Um, there's some lessons to be learned from what we went through in the planning process as well as the execution. And I think that uh, reaching out like this and having the stories of the people who got an opportunity to be there will say that, yes, let's, let's keep this a special moment in time and let's wait uh, until an appropriate date to do it again. Thank you for spending time with me again. Yeah. I appreciate it. We got a lot of information today that we didn't capture in November, obviously, because the event hadn't happened quite yet. I, won't, right. I think you and I had met on Thursday or Wednesday. We met Thursday. on the, the 7th. So I had we hadn't even marked uh, the 100th anniversary of the arrival of the Unknown Soldier to Washington Naval Yard, gotcha. um, where we did a ceremony and we, we uh, presented the Navy with an educational plaque that is now stands on the spot where the unknown soldier came home a hundred years later. So yeah, there was a lot of stuff that was still brewing and coming to a close and, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of strings being pulled to make that happen. Uh, and I'm thankful that you're reaching out now that I've had an opportunity to actually, you know, take it all in and chew on it and, and, and relive the, some of those emotions. Outstanding. Well, again, thank you for your service. Thank you for your continued service to your yeah. state out West and um, what you do with the nonprofit is fantastic. I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Good afternoon. This is Greg Pass with the Americans in wartime experience. Today's date is March 12, 2022. It is 1544 hours Eastern standard time. I'm in uh, Northern Virginia near Washington, DC. And I have the pleasure of um, having, and I, I always say it wrong. And I said it wrong earlier. McElvina. McElvina. That's good. Matt, good enough. Echelvena. Good enough for government work, right? That's right. Amy, can you give us your full name, the correct way to say it, and where you were born? Amy Lynette McElvena, Lincoln, Nebraska. And um, as we were talking prior to the tape starting, um, you and I had the pleasure of meeting um, in November of 2021 inside the yep. mobile recording studio, and we captured um, a part of your story from your career. Uh, today, we're going to focus mostly on the, um, the ceremonies at the tomb in November, but I do, I would like you to take a moment just very briefly to talk us about, talk to us about your career when, when you uh, joined um, the military and just a basic overview of your military career. I joined the um, Army Reserve when I was a senior in high school in uh, December of 1982 and started going to weekend drills while I was still a senior in high school. And then I went to basic training um, at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, probably a month after I graduated high school. So um, then I stayed in the reserves for a little while. And um, once I moved away from Nebraska into Indiana, I joined the Indiana National Guard. Then when I moved to Oregon, I was in the Oregon National Guard. And then I finished up my career back in the Army Reserves. And what year would that have been when you finished? Uh, 2018 is when I retired. Okay. And um, you have a special connection, though, with um, Arlington National Cemetery. Please tell us what that connection is and, and your role with it. So my husband, Gavin McElvena, uh, was a tomb guard and over the course of the past five years served as the president of the Society of the Honor Guard, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And I actually serve as the bereavement committee coordinator for the Society of the Honor Guard, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Okay. And um, tell us a little bit about the first time you ever had the pleasure to visit Arlington National Cemetery. And what were your observations? Well, the first time I went, I was four years old. So I don't really remember much about that. My uncle was in the Navy and he was stationed down in Virginia Beach. 
and my mother and I had gone to visit and we went to Washington DC. So I don't really, you know, remember that trip, but um, I think it was about 2010 when uh, Gavin and I had been married for five years and I encouraged him to go to a reunion and um, because he'd been a founder and he'd kind of not been too active in the society for a while, I said, hey, well, let's go. So we went to a reunion and um, I just was in awe. I was in awe of everything, of um, going to the, the tomb and watching tomb guards you know, do their duty and meeting tomb guards and just um, being in a room with brothers and sisters who served in the military, but were able to do this really elite job. And I was like, we're getting involved. And so <laughs> we got involved. <laughs> Let's delve a little bit more into your initial observations. What what may, what you said that you were in awe. What, what exactly was it that made you um, so impressed with the operation there? Well, you've been there, so you know everything is done to precision, and um, just the time it takes, and um, watching the guys like shine their shoes and get their uniforms ready, and hearing about how long these tasks take and how dedicated they are and how they, you know, earn papers, earn time on the mat, um, get inspected, pass the tests just to become a tomb guard and to earn the badge was incredible to me. As a nurse, you know, there's um, part, part of my job has to do with precision and doing things correctly and, you know, being exact. And so I appreciate uh, the exactness and the precision that they do everything in. And I just, I, I was in awe that people took their duty so seriously and were so committed and had such high work ethic. So um, at some point in time, conversations started to occur about how um, we were gonna mark the, the 100th anniversary. Uh, were you a part of that? And if so, what was your role? And, and give us a little background on the planning that went into this. Well, um, mostly it was Gavin and the Centennial committee that really you know worked on these things but of course he bounces things off of me and um so you know because we're talking about a burial site of of a soldier so um for a time I was a hospice nurse and then and like I said um I'm the bereavement committee coordinator so um my job with the society deals with honoring and remembering fallen tomb guards and helping their family through that process and providing some um, activities, uh, memorial cards and bouquets, and even trying to get some tomb guards to go to these funerals or celebrations of life. And so um, it means a lot to me. I mean, death, it's a part of life and how we honor that, it means something to me. And so to be able to talk to Gavin about how you know, that would be best served for everyone and, and hear his ideas and, and you know be a sounding board for him. It was very interesting and, and how everything kind of you know progressed from you know, a few years ago, let's let's do these um, bell ringings on Veterans Day to never forget gardens and to actually have a plaque to put in your never forget garden. And then that just you know snowballed to let's have a rose that's to uh, the tomb. So they, they met with a, a rosier and created this never forget rose. And it just snowballed from there on and on until, you know, then the idea of, wow, wouldn't it be great if the citizens of this country could actually pay their respects just as they did a hundred years ago at the tomb itself and place a flower there, something they've not been able to do since 1921. And, you know, that's, it's pretty significant. So um, tell us a little bit about your observations when you, act, you, you, you had the, um, you got to see this unique um, ceremony taking place and, and people like you and veterans and people from other countries were able to actually walk onto the plaza. Tell us what, what that experience uh, was and, and your observations of other people that were moving around. Well, I've always been envious in some way when I see, you know, the Sentinel walking or I, I watch a wreath ceremony. Not that how I pay my respects is any less respectful or, you know, heartfelt, 
um, when I'm standing there on the steps, you know, and giving my respects. Um, but to be able to actually do it myself, I've done a wreath ceremony and, and that was great. But to be able to walk by myself and place a rose, you know, and stand there in front of the tomb and think about that sacrifice and um, watch other people do it. It was amazing because I think that Arlington National Cemetery and even other people, because I, you know, I'm on Facebook and I'm on a few Facebook pages where people talk about this kind of stuff. Um, there was a lot of concern that the tomb would get desecrated or you know, that people would be disrespectful. And um, I didn't see one act of disrespect happen there. People were very respectful. Um, very dignified. I think the people that actually participated, um, while they may not know the entire history of the tomb, I think that they understand what it represents. And so um, it was just really awesome to get to see that. My best friend and her husband came out with us as well with um, their daughter. And so she was able to do this too. And you know, it was really awesome to see my friend get to do this. And my friend really didn't know anything about the tomb until I met her a few, you know, years ago. And, you know, her education about the tomb and her husband's education about the tomb and my children's education and my granddaughter's education, you know, it's all been a part of our life. And to get to do that and to watch other people get to do that was amazing. Um, I got to be in the press pit when my husband and my granddaughter laid their flowers and I got to take pictures of them doing it. And that was, that was amazing to get to see that. Um, that's something while she may not understand the full significance of it now at nine years old, in a few years, she will. And um, I was also there when Chief Plenty Coup uh, group came through and did their flower ceremony. And I took a lot of pictures of that and I cried when they looked into my eyes, I cried because it was just, I know the history of their, of Chief Pl Plenty Coup. And so I got to see that too. And in the full regalia and being allowed on the tomb plaza in front of it, doing a flower ceremony was amazing. It's where they should have been. It's where they belonged. And, and so to see all of that was very overwhelming. Administratively, um, how, how is it organized? I assume that there wasn't a box of roses and people would just bum rush the, the oh, no. they had to, re they had to um, register no, and, and um, they had to show up. How, how did that, how did that actually work? Well, I know that roses were brought in on trucks um, from, I think the American Rose Society maybe, and people volunteered, including um, some of the Gold Star Mothers um, who went to France with us to commemorate the centennial. They were there to pass out flowers to people. So I think it was handled really well. Um, when you came up to the plaza, you were handed a flower and then you just formed a line and waited to take your turn. And so it was very well organized, I think. Um, they did a great job. And, and I know that when Gavin and the society had proposed this to Arlington, again, there was concern about you know, was it going to be just this big giant mess? And I think that overall the plan and the execution was done very well and very respectfully. Um, I, I was, I, I asked Javin the question, I don't know if you heard, um, people have different opinions about if we should wait another hundred years. What, what, what are your thoughts? And if you were queen for a day, um, <laughs> what would be your call? When, when would we do it again? Well, I think that a hundred year anniversary for every internment would be appropriate, you know, even, even with the Vietnam unknown, because, you know, obviously Vietnam unknown is not there any longer, but I think that it shouldn't be done every year. I know that there has been some rumor. I think that would take away from the, the whole thing. I think it would take away from the, the ceremony. I think it would take away from the specialness of that. I think that it should be done in significant milestone pieces. I don't know that a hundred years really, you know, um, is needed, but maybe 50, you know, the 50, that, the, and that's a long period of time, 50 years. Um, but it should be done just like we did November 11th. It should be done on the internment days. I think anniversaries of the internment days, because that would, that would be significant and that would be appropriate. 
what makes Arlington National Cemetery, particularly the tomb, special to you? Well, obviously, because I'm a veteran, it means something to me. But um, there are certain things um, like the nurses memorial there. I go every year to the nurses memorial. Um, and I, you know, I stand there in front of that nurse and I think about all the nurses before me, you know, who, who went to war, answered the call of their country and may not have made it back. Or maybe they did make it back with significant mental and physical scars, but they served their country and they served other soldiers you know, in their duty. Um, I lost a really good friend in Iraq in 2006. And I don't go home to Indiana enough. And I have never been to his grave. But when I go to Arlington, and I'm there in front of the tomb, that's who I think about. I think about Staff Sergeant Richard Blakely, who gave his life. And so that's where I go to mourn for him. And so I think it's important. I think a lot of people go there with that kind of same thing that maybe they've lost a, a loved one and they, they don't go to their grave, but that's one place that they can go and remember them. Let's take a second to put in a plug for the society. Can you tell us the, the name of the society, um, where we can find it on, on the internet um, and how um, the general public can support the mission of the society? Uh, so the name of our organization is the Society of the Honor Guard, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Uh, they have a website, uh, tombguard.org. And their mission is to educate the public about the tomb and what Arlington National C Cemetery means to us as a country. And on that website, you can find information. You can even request that a former tomb guard or current tomb sentinel come to your organization or church or school and speak about the tomb and educate your organization about the tomb. Outstanding. Is there anything else that you wanted to document that we didn't talk about when it, as it, um, in regards to the ceremony that occurred? Well, I think that overall, when, when I look at our trip to France, um, that was such a significant lead up to what happened in, in Arlington. Um, and how the French welcomed us there. Um, I think that people really need to put aside what they may feel about somebody, you know, their country or whatever, and really realize that we're all connected in some way, even with what's going on right now in Ukraine. Um, I think that for myself personally, I work with a Russian surgeon and I work with Ukrainian nurses in two different places. And, you know, um, we, we're all connected in some way and we need to think about that. We're all human beings. We all want to live decent lives and good lives. Unfortunately, we've all in some way or another been affected by war whenever that war may have happened, we've all been affected by it. And I think that we just need to remember that we're all human, we're all connected, and we all feel these struggles. And I think the centennial was one way to kind of bridge a gap between us and France and um, really close those ties across the ocean. And we made friends, uh, you know, just met great people over there and participated in some beautiful remembrances that we will always cherish. And I think anybody that gets an opportunity to go to a foreign country should go to their Tomb of the Unknown Soldier and pay their respects. Very nice. Well, thank you again for spending some time with me. I, I, I appreciate it. Nice and to see you again. <laughs>